That's been one of my favorite songs lately. It's called Promises by Maverick City Music. Man, it is so good. Now, uh, if you got your phones out or if you brought your Bible, go to Joshua chapter 9. I'd like to invite Jeff up to read this uh, for us. We're continuing our uh, kind of walk through Joshua, and this is a very fascinating text for us today. Thank you, Jeff. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan and in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions toward, and took out sacks, worn out sacks for their donkeys, and wineskins worn out and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes, and all the provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps, perhaps you live among us, then how can we make a covenant with you? Then how can we make a covenant with you? They said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all they did in Egypt and all that they did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, the king of Eshbon, and to Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Astroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants, come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to see you. But now behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jeff. Lots of names in there, yes. and you <laughs> nailed it. I love it. Yeah, so keep your, uh, if you have your Bible or uh, your phone, just keep, keep it right there. I want to kick it off with just a question for you here, for those with us online, to ask the people around you and to answer. You can do that in the chat box if you're with us online. And it's simply this. Have you ever had buyer's regret or buyer's remorse? And what was that item? If you're kind of sitting by yourself safely from a distance to the person next to you, answer that question. Buyer's remorse and what did you buy? I'll give you about 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. <laughs> I'm sure we all have things we purchased and immediately regretted. Video games. Uh, at the earlier service I brought up is more about like shows I got into that turned terrible, but you're so invested that you keep watching and you're like, man, I just wasted my life. Uh, other ones, for buyer's remorse, now that I'm a dad of three kids, it usually comes with buying children toys because I'm like, oh, they're going to love it. And they turn out to be absolutely obnoxious or terribly messy. And I'm like, what have we done? Or along those same lines with my kids, I have a lot of like promises remorse where, you know, I need my kids to calm down or get them to do something. I'm like, I, just, I promise you, if you, just follow, if you just listen, just quiet down, we'll go do A, B, and C tomorrow or next week. My kids, they don't remember anything except for, guess what they remember? The promises that I made to them. And I usually, usually re regret them. They're watching online. I love you, kids. I love you and your toys. Um, but in our text for today, that's kind of where the people of Israel, they're at 
not buyers, but promises remorse, promises regret with this nation of, of Gibeon. And uh, because they enter into a covenant, which is a list of, this is like promises. And, and uh, as we dig into it, I want you guys to keep kind of two words in your head that we're going to dig into. It's covenant and counsel. Covenant and counsel. That is the downfall of Israel in this text, but tangentially and maybe in a parallel fashion, good news for us, and I'll explain more in a second. So grab those Bibles again on your phone. Uh, look at Joshua 9 verse 1. In 9 verse 1, what we're seeing is a coalition being created. Uh, the people of Israel have come over the Jordan. Uh, this is God's land. He's fighting for them, and he has promised it to his people. And so they have victory after victory. And these other nations, they're seeing what's happening. They know uh, what they're all about, and so they decide, you know, your enemy is my enemy, and so why don't we just become frenemies for a while to take out this enemy? And we're going to do it in battle. But then you have the Gibeonites, uh, Gibeon, who uh, is another local country uh, that uh, is inhabiting the promised land, and they take a different tactic. They're not going to meet Israel in battle because they know that is futile. That is not going to work. And so you see a scripture in like verse 4, it says they went with cunning. They went with deception. And their deception is, it's deep. And it is well done, right? It's like a theater, right? They put out worn out sackcloths on their donkeys. They have worn out clothes. Their sandals are all beat up. Their bread's cut. They, they did not miss a detail. The bread's crumbly. The wine skins have burst. And so they show up seemingly all ragged and tattered, and they say, make a covenant with us. Why would they want, why go directly to a covenant? And I'll explain in a second. So they show up, they look tired and worn out, and they say, make a covenant with us. And then Joshua and the men of Israel, right, if you look at verse uh, 7, they say to, to them, perhaps you live among us. And how can we make a covenant with you? Because God made it clear. Don't make covenants with the people of this land. Because if you do, you, you're weak. You will fall into temptation. You will fall after their pagan gods. And that's not going to go well for, for you. So don't make those covenants. So they know that. And, so, and, then, and then Joshua steps up. Or they say to Joshua, no, 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 no. We are your servants. We're your servants, man. And Joshua, the leader, says, who are you? And where do you come from? Kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Who is your daddy and what does he do? And notice they, they don't give a direct answer. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We are not close. We're from afar, real far. We can't even tell you the name of it because you wouldn't know it. That's how far we are, are, are from, from you. Also, I mean, look at this bread we brought. It was warm out of the oven when we left, and now it's crumbly. If we live close, would our bread look like this? And what do Joshua and the leaders do? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It wouldn't be that way. You must not live, live close. They're completely duped, right? It's just silly and foolishness. And so they make this covenant with Gibeon. Now, I ask the question, why make a, a covenant? A covenant is more than just a legal agreement. This is a relationally binding covenant, commitment. And in a covenant, there is a greater party and a lesser party. So in our text, right, Gibeon's the lesser, right? They're the, the nation in need. And Israel is the greater. And so the lesser comes to the greater and says, make this covenant with us, we know that the Lord's fighting for you, that we don't, we don't stand a chance. And so make this covenant. And, um, and so Israel agrees. And within a covenant, there are promises and commitments. The promises come from the greater party. And the promise in this case is Israel says, we'll be at peace with you. We won't harm you. And the commitment from, the, from Gideon is that they will be servants. They'll be Israel's servants. Now, uh, the ink is not even dry on the covenant documents, and they discover that they've been deceived. 
that they're not a three days journey. And in that day and age, three day journey, that's, that's like your next door neighbor, man. That's like the next, next town over. And the people of Israel, they murmur against Joshua and the leader saying, how did you let this happen? And then they say, let's just wipe them out. They deceived us. Doesn't that, doesn't that nullify the covenant? And here's what's so fascinating. No. It doesn't nullify the covenant. This relational agreement uh, to steal, uh, I think the reason, it's two reasons. One, I'm going to steal a quote from my third grade teacher. Two wrongs don't make a right. Just because you got deceived doesn't mean you can wrongfully break the covenant. Second, I think this is a more important application of why they couldn't do it, is uh, uh, when, when Israel entered into a covenant, Israel is the living embodiment of the Lord on, on earth at this time, right? He's supposed to be his people. And so he is a God who keeps covenant. And so this would be a, a failure to reflect who God is. It would tarnish his name and his people. And so that's why they keep this covenant. Now, let's talk about us. Because I know the word covenant may sound strange and, and old to us, uh, but it's a very pertinent word uh, to, to us. A lot of us are in semi-covenants, right? How many of you have like a credit card or a mortgage, right? Those are legally binding documents. Uh, they do miss the relational aspect, uh, but many of us are or know somebody who's married. Guys, that's covenant. Those, that's a legal agreement, but a relational commitment. That's a covenant. And often between the greater and lesser, like in my case, Joy, much greater than me. As the lesser, I came to her and just proposed. And uh, for some astonishing reason that my sisters can't figure out, she said, yes. This is a binding covenant, babe. You're in it. And there are promises and commitments that are a part of that relational commitment, that, that, that covenant that need to be lived, lived out. And now maybe for some of you, you're still thinking, yeah, that, you know, I got a friend that's married or whatever, but covenant language still doesn't mean much to, to, to me. But all of us, from that baptismal font, we just saw that with Penelope and Keegan, entered into a covenant. Now we are in a covenant relationship with the living God. And now here's what's so mind-blowing about this covenant. Oftentimes, the lesser goes to the greater. Well, in God's kingdom, in his activity, the greater has come to the lesser, right? Jesus, God in flesh, comes to us in the muck, in the mire, our sin and our brokenness, and offers covenant with us. The lesser, we have no ground to stand on. It's food, like, why would he do it? We don't deserve this. Yet he comes and offers this covenant to us. Us into uh, historically, like in the Old Testament, uh, sacrifice was needed to establish the covenant. And in our covenant relationship with the living God, the greater not only came to us, but he became the sacrifice to solidify this covenant. That Jesus is the Lamb of God. His blood is the new covenant poured out for you and me. He establishes it. Not only initiates, but establishes the covenant with us and then offers us promises. And in this covenant relationship, he promises forgiveness, which I know we hear that word a lot, but that is our deepest need, is forgiveness our sinfulness, our brokenness. That's what provides life and healing and salvation. And those two are promises from Jesus and he promises his presence. He promises his peace. He promises access to him. And there are commitments on our end that he wants us to be a relationship, a living, active relationship. And it's to love him with everything we have. And guys, he's worth it. He is worth everything. And to love our neighbors as ourselves. And now in our text, Gibeon, they deceived Israel. And the people thought that should negate the covenant, but it didn't. 
Because this covenant is a reflection of who their God is. And now think about us. How often have we been unfaithful to the commitments of this covenant? How many times have we been deceptive and lied? How many of you have ever told a lie? If you're not raising a hand, guess what? You're lying to your pastor right now. It's terrible. Right? We lie, we lie to each other. We lie to ourselves. We even try to lie to God, as silly as that, that is. Now imagine, imagine if our deception negated the covenant God has with us. How horrifying and terrifying and helpless and hopeless would we be? But thanks be to God that these, this covenant rests on Him and not our ability or inability to keep the covenant. And I want to share that not so that we can feel like, oh, I can do whatever I want then. That's not what it is. But for us, first and foremost, just stand in awe of this covenant of who Jesus is and who we are to him. And to let you know that you are never too far gone. He will always pursue you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. Nothing can snatch you from his hand or remove his love from you. He wants to renew this covenant to bring you back, to remind you of who you are and who who he is. So covenant, this is huge in the Old Testament and huge for, for us. Now they make a bad covenant and they do pay the price. It's there are consequences that come in the future of Israel, but here's what's so beautiful. God remains faithful. Paul says it this way, that we see the fullness of God keeping his covenant in Jesus Christ because all of the promises, all of the covenants of God are yes in Jesus Christ. So he is is faithful despite our often unfaithfulness. And now, covenant, that's covenant, counsel. How in the world did this happen, we can ask, and... uh, Scripture sums it up in a half of a verse. Look at verse 14. So the men of Israel took some of their, this being Gibeon's provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. There it is. That's why they failed. They didn't seek his face. They didn't, they have, they right now have access to the living God and they decided to go under their own wisdom, their own strength, their own power. And look where it got him. And now before you uh, go down the judgment train too far, um, I began to reflect uh, upon my own life, my own faith journey. And uh, the faith journey for Israel right now is success after success after success. And I think that blinded them from their need, their dependency upon the Lord. And, and when I reflect on my own faith journey, when I have found I failed the most, when I've like pushed devotional life, prayer life, seeking the counsel of the Lord to the back burner, guess when that happens? When life is going well. I honestly think that success, prosperity, abundance is one of the greatest threats to our faith. Because we think we've got this. We're doing this on our own. We go under our own strength, our own power, our own wisdom. We're blinded to our dependency upon the Lord and we go off on our own. And that never goes well. They didn't seek the counsel of the Lord. And how often do we not seek the counsel of the Lord even though we have access to Him? And let me tell you, that is amazing grace, guys. That you, because of your covenant relationship, you can go to Him and He promises to hear you, hear our prayers to give us the wisdom and discernment and leadership that we, that we need. But how do we do that nowadays? One is right here. We're doing it. Digging into his word. Learning from his people on what to do and clearly what, what not to do. To learn from their mistakes. They didn't seek his counsel. Let's not make that same mistake. Because there are so many things coming at us nowadays to say, hey, why don't you make a covenant with me? Why don't, we, why don't, we, why don't you just follow after, after me? And 
I can't tell you how many times I blindly say, oh yeah, that sounds good. And it leads to brokenness and (laughs) nothing good. But here, this treasure invites us to seek the counsel of the Lord. That here we get to learn who our God is, what he has done for us and who we are to him. How do we seek the counsel of the Lord? Prayer. Keeping the conversation going with the living God. Participating in that in that relationship. How do we seek the counsel of the Lord? Guys, it's here. Worshiping. Giving God our glory and our honor and our praise because he deserves it. This is a reminder that we are absolutely dependent upon him. That's why we come to worship. Because we know we need him. And he shows up. We hear his word. We receive his grace. Each other. We need each other. To admonish one another, to encourage one another, to lift each other up. This is how we seek the counsel of of the Lord. And so, uh, this week, to make this not just a Sunday thing, but to help us kind of solidify counsel and covenant in our our life, I want to to encourage you to do a couple things. Uh, One is to memorize two scripture passages for me, or at least write them down. I'd encourage you to memorize. There's something beautiful about treasuring God's word in your heart and mind. And the first is from Luke 22 verse 20. So type it in your phone, text it to yourself, email yourself, Luke 22 verse 20. And this is Jesus uh, at the Last Supper. It says this, In the same way, after the supper, he, Jesus, took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant. In my blood poured out for who? You. You. And then, for counsel. Uh, Psalm 73, especially verse 24, but I threw in 25 and 26 because they're like my favorite verses in the book of Psalms. But write it down, Psalm 73, verse 24, memorize this. You, and this is a psalmist speaking to the Lord, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. And 25 and 26, like I said, these are like my favorite verses in the, old, in, uh, the book of Psalms. But it says this, uh, Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on this earth I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail. My strength, my wisdom may fail. My friends, my family, this world may fail, will fail me. My heart and my flesh may fail, but you, O Lord, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's good. And then... I want to invite everybody as a community to fast and pray together on Wednesday, to do that together. And fasting is this uh, ancient spiritual discipline where you set aside something you depend on. Usually it's food, but it could be anything. Netflix, Facebook, social media, whatever it might be. You set that aside for for a specific period of time, and you use that time to focus on Jesus and to pray to seek his face, his counsel over your life, over your family, over your friends, over this world. I just want to invite you to do that together as a community. Let's fast in and pray. In fact, let me pray for us right now. Father in heaven, we get to call you Father because of this covenantal relationship you established with us through your son, Jesus. And I pray that we uh, be filled with your spirit so that we can stand in awe of that relationship, of that covenant you have made with us so that we may delight and rejoice in the promises we have in you and fill us with your spirit so that we may honor and fulfill our commitments to you to love you with everything we have and to love our neighbors. And Father, help us to seek your face. How amazing that you give us access so that we can have your counsel and be with us. Give us your wisdom and discernment. And I ask this in the most precious and powerful name, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.